Uh, Pastor Mauricio, he asked me uh, if I could speak on 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 18. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 18, it says, we set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. What we see will only last a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. You know, and when he was telling me to speak on this scripture, he wanted me to really talk about um, how we decide to look past our natural circumstances and see what God sees for us, okay? And the way that God sees is different from us, okay? Because God is a spirit. And while we are spirits too, I mean, he's God and we're not, right? And so he thinks and he sees differently, you know? And there was a time where I thought, well, maybe I see and think kind of like him, like a lot, because I was made in his image and likeness. But what I found out was I'm not even close, not even close. It says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And that's really true because you think about it, he multitasks every single day. He listens to all of our prayers, right, at the same time, and yet he has time to make sure the sun comes up, the moon comes up, the ocean, um, tides go in and out, the winds blow, all these different things, and he's doing it like clockwork, and he can multitask millions and millions of tasks. He can see into the future. As soon as Adam and Eve fell, he already started to create a plan hundreds and thousands of years in advance. I, I can't even think what I'm going to do tomorrow, right? And I, I can't even read my wife's mind. And so, you know, God is so much bigger, and he thinks on a totally different level, okay? But just because he does that, that doesn't mean that we cannot tap into the way he thinks and sees because that's what we're supposed to do. As you grow in your Christian maturity, part of what you are called to do is to learn how to think, how to understand, how to see how God sees. You know, and the ways that he talks to you is totally different than what a lot of people think. You know, a lot of times his communication styles are different. Take, for instance, uh, visions and dreams, okay? Like I know everybody here, you guys have had dreams, right? But sometimes you have funky dreams, and it's not because you ate pizza late at night. <laughs> but you have a dream or a vision, and you think, wow, that was really, really strange. What, what is that all about? And then you just blow it off, and you go, well, I, I can't understand it, right? But you know, there's books that you can read about how to interpret your visions and your dreams. And so I started to read some of these books. And for me personally, I remember one dream where I was driving in a fast car. It was a very, very beautiful red Mustang. And when I first got that dream, I knew God wasn't going to give me a red Mustang. Okay. <laughs> But what it meant symbolically to me was that God was expediting me to another level, okay? And that's how you interpret dreams sometimes. And so when God talks to you, you have to know how to interpret. You have to know how to understand what he's saying to you because he wants to talk to you all the time, you know? And Moses, um, he's known as a great leader. And in Psalms 103, verse 7, this was a psalm that was written by King David. It says, he, God, made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. Okay, so the children of Israel, they saw all their acts, but Moses understood why. And you think about that. You know, the children of Israel, when they were coming out of Egypt, they saw all these miracles. They saw the plagues of the frogs and the lice. They saw darkness. They saw the Nile turned into blood. 
They saw all these things to deliver them. Then they saw the Red Sea open up so that they could cross over. They saw manna on the ground that they could eat every day. They saw multitudes of miracles. But what did they do? Even though they saw all these miracles, they kept complaining. Why? Because they didn't understand his ways. They saw his acts, but they did not understand his ways. And Moses is a great leader because the Bible says right there, he understood God's ways. Okay? So if you want to see, if you want to know what God is doing, you have to understand how he moves. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is how do you go about doing stuff like that? So the first thing that you have to understand in this whole process, right, is that God never changes. In Hebrews, it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God never changes, okay? And we are called to be like him. So if he never changes, guess who has to change? Us, right? But here's the problem. We don't like change. And I know it. Because you go to any office, anytime they update the Windows operating system, or the Mac operating system, you hear it all over the place, right? Why, they, why do they have to change the system? I like the way it was. Now I have to learn all over again. Or your kids, when they're going to a new school, they say to your parents, I don't want to go to a school. I, I like the way it was. Why do we have to change, right? And you older people, you, you buy a new TV and you don't understand how to use the controls, <laughs> right? And you go, why do I have to change it all the time? And you give it to your kids, and you say, figure it out, and then teach me. <laughs> right? We just don't like change. But the simple fact is, God is saying that's part of our DNA, that we are supposed to love change. We're supposed to love change. Okay? And, but when change happens, there's a certain pattern to it. Okay? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that there are different seasons. There is a time to sow and a time to reap. You know, there is a time of war, a time of peace. There's a time of scattering and a time of gathering. There's all these different seasons. And you have to change with the seasons. Okay, like right now, a lot of you, you're wearing coats, right, because it's cold. But you're not going to be wearing coats six months from now. Nobody, I mean, I hope that you guys are not wearing coats six months from now. But what you have to understand is in different seasons, you have to do things differently, right? But some of us as Christians, what we think is, I'll just do the same thing all the time. And then you wonder why, why it doesn't work. It's because you don't understand you're in a different season. So you have to be conscious of the season that you are in so that you can change what you need to change, okay? Because everybody goes through seasons. Now, there are many different seasons for Christians, but I want to talk about two seasons in particular that uh, we all go through. And I call them mountaintop experiences and valley experiences. On the mountaintop is when you have great success, when you have victory, when you're just experiencing the goodness of God and you just take it in. God doesn't want you to press in harder and try to learn things. All he wants you to do is just enjoy the victory, enjoy the scene, enjoy the blessing of God. And there are times when you're supposed to just literally kick back and just enjoy his goodness, right? But guess what? You can't live there forever. Because, like, the mountaintop, like Mount Everest, okay, if you go to Mount Everest and you're on the, the top, there's no oxygen there, okay? You can't stay there forever. You'll die. You can't grow anything there. Life does not exist long term on the mountaintop. It's meant for you to enjoy for a season, but then you have to come back off the mountain, okay? So the other season you have is the valley. Valley is where you do all the life. 
That's where all the water is. That's where they grow all the crops. That's where you do all the hard work. That's where the problems are. That's where the challenges are. And sometimes we don't like it. We don't like the challenges. We don't like the problems, right? And so when we go into the valley, we think, oh, what am I doing here? Why, God, what's going on? And we don't understand how to do life in the valley. Okay? But I, I'm going to help you with that. You see, when you are in the valley, okay, that's when you have your problems. That's when you have opportunities. Okay? So when you're having problems, do you know what God thinks about you right then and there? Most of the time, people think, God, why did you leave me? What, what's happening? And, and you don't understand it, and you think that God doesn't love you, and he's picking on you because you have problems. But that's not the way he sees it, okay? He doesn't see it that way. In fact, I want to share with you a scripture. And um, let me read it here. It's in Psalms 105, verses 24 and 25. I'll read it, and then I'll explain it to you. This is God. He says, he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. Okay, in the very next verse, it says, he turned their heart to hate his people to deal craftily with his servants. So God builds up his people, makes them strong, and the very next verse, guess what he does? He taps on the shoulder of his enemies, and he makes them go after his people. Well, that's kind of strange, right? Why, why would God do something like that? God increases you, makes you strong first. Okay, He never will bring anything against you that you cannot handle. So he's going to make sure that you're strong, you're capable, you have every chance, every ability has been given to you so that you can overcome. He does that first. That's what it says in the first verse. Okay, So he strengthens you. Once he strengthens you, now he tests you, and he brings opposition. Why does he do that? Because we are called overcomers, right? You can't be an overcomer if you don't overcome something. And God calls you an overcomer. And when you overcome, you get the blessing, and you go back to the mountaintop, and you experience the, the peace, the joy, the goodness of God. But... You have to overcome to get to the next level. So when the problems come, all it means is God is saying to you, you my man. I believe in you. I think you can do more than what you think. I think you are strong and you are victorious. So God is bragging on you. God is saying you can do it. That's what he's saying. So when troubles come, all it means is you're about to get upgraded. But what you have to do in this time is you have to press in. You have to have the ability to hear what he's saying to you. That's, that's where most people miss it. When you have a problem, a lot of people complain instead of pressing in and to saying, God, you made me to be an overcomer, so now what do I do? The, the thing about living in the valleys is that's when you're going to get if you push in and you really try to hear his voice and you want to see what he says to you, that's when he's going to reveal secrets to you that have never been revealed before. I believe that there are secrets that have never been given to mankind yet. But some of you in this room, if you will press in, God will give you the secrets that have never been revealed. That's how we get things like inventions, right? Because God will gift that to someone. And, and it's not just inventions like a, a smartphone. I mean, it could be witty things like how to stop human trafficking or how to stop poverty or how to take over this entire city for Christ. God will give you secrets that have never been uttered before. But you have to press in. You have to press in. You have to ask God, God, okay, I'm experiencing this, but it's because you are trying to get my attention so I can get the victory. So what do I need to do? So that's the key. Whenever you have a problem, 
Okay, if you're not in total just, you know, sin and you know you're in sin, if you are, you just repent and then you're back on track. But if you're not and things are happening to you, that's when you have to press in. And you have to say, God, I need to hear your voice. Okay, and like I said before, there are many different ways where you can hear the voice of God. Because God talks in a lot of different ways. Because when I was when I was studying this, God talks to, I mean, there's over like 13, 15, 18 different ways that he talks. And a lot of them are not verbal. Okay. If I were to ask this entire congregation right now, how many of you have ever heard the audible voice of God? Okay. And you'll hear, a, you'll see a couple of people raise their hand. But for the vast majority of us, we've never heard it. Right? So you know that God talks in different ways. And so I want to share with you one of the ways that you can position yourself on a daily basis so that you have the opportunity to hear him more clearly. Okay? And so I'm going to show you this one video right now. And I'm going to preface it by saying this is a lady. Her name is Candace Payne. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she's kind of famous. But she was a worship leader in her church. Okay? And she's a mom. She has kids. And one day she uploaded this YouTube video. And she just did it because she thought it was funny. Right? She uploads it. She goes to bed. And the next day when she wakes up, she finds out there's 20 million views in one day. It's the Guinness's World Book of Records of most views in 24 hours. Okay? So I'm just going to let you watch it. And then we're going to talk about it after you watch it. Doing good. Okay, so this is what I got. Once again, this is for me, not for Duncan, not for Cadence. I mean, I'll let them play with it. I'm not a bad mom. I'm not a jerk. But in all honesty, at the end of the day, it doesn't go in their toy box. It goes in my room. So here we go. I got to take off my glasses for it. <laughs> oh, naturally. Okay, here we go. So Yes! Now watch when my mouth actually moves. <laughs> That's not me making that noise, it's the mask! Here, listen. Okay, that's just a short clip of it. It actually goes on for five minutes. Okay, she laughs like that for five minutes. Okay, why, why am I talking about this? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Okay, the joy of the Lord is your strength. People watch this, and they invited her on, you know, like, Good Morning America, all these big shows, and... People out there, the non-Christians, they, they just couldn't get enough of it. They couldn't get enough of it because they don't know about joy. They don't know about joy. But in Romans, okay, this is what it says. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, think about that again. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the kingdom. Okay? When you hear a scripture like that, it's huge. It's telling you this is the characteristics of God. God is righteous. He's peaceful. 
but he's also joyful. And so many times as Christians, we talk about doing the right thing, right? That's righteousness. We talk about the peace of God that passes understanding. But we normally don't talk so much about joy. But joy is really part of God's own character. It's actually part of his character. And if you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you actually have the ability to function in joy. Okay? So it's not that you can't do it. Some of you might not do it because you might be rusty. But joy is one of those things that will attract. It will be like a light. It will attract other people in. Okay? And not only that, but joy unravels many different keys for you. Okay? Because have you ever heard of that, that phrase, blind rage? Okay? When people get so angry that they can't think straight. You could talk to them logically, and they won't understand a word you're saying. Right? They, they just can't. The same thing goes for joy. When you are functioning in joy, all of a sudden, you have the ability to hear God. You're positioning yourself so that it's easier to hear God because it's part of his nature. Because when you're functioning in joy, you are not thinking about yourself. When you're functioning in joy, typically what you're trying to do is you're trying to be a blessing to someone else. And so there's nothing that you're thinking about yourself. You're just thinking, how can I be a blessing to someone else? And joy has to be intentional. Because the Bible says that joy lives in us, and yet so many of us don't experience it on a regular basis, like every single day, that you have to wonder why. It's because we're not intentional about it. And so you have to create an intentionality about joy. So that's something that I try to do. Like in Thailand, I, I train a lot of our Bible school students. And when I go around and I talk to them, I used to just go and ask them, how are you today? And like a normal um, young adult, they'll tell me one word, fine, right? One word, fine. And then they'll try to walk away. Just like my son, when I ask him, how are you? Fine, right? Because boys don't talk a lot. But I didn't let them off the hook because I knew that's, that's the standard answer. I mean, if you were to go to someone right now and you go, hey, how are you doing today? You would think nothing of it if they told you fine, and then you say, okay, and then you just walk off. But I don't let our kids off that easy. So I would start to ask them, what percentage are you fine? <laughs> Give me a number between 1 and 100. And then they would say stuff like 50%. Okay? If you tell me 50%, you're not fine. Right? <laughs> and, and then they start to catch on. So what would they say? 100% every day. 100%. <laughs> right? It's like saying fine all over again. So then I would ask them, why? Why are you 100% fine? And then they would have to come up with an answer. <laughs> right? But as I did that to them, guess what they would do to me? They would do the same thing back to me. Right? But now, I would do it to a lot of different students. But can you imagine if all those students did it back to me? Now I have to answer that question like 40 times a day, right? So I created a system to help me walk in joy. Because now I couldn't tell our, our, our students, oh, I'm fine, and not be fine, right? And so it's a way to be intentional. And so I would say, a thousand percent, a million percent. You know, and they would always ask me why. And then I would have to come up with different answers every single time they answered me that. So I had to have like 40 different answers every day. But what it does is it helps you focus on how do I be a blessing to others? How can I do this on a regular basis? And, you know, there's actually studies done on this. And there's this book called The Happiness Advantage. And it's a secular book. It's written by this guy, Sean Anker. And it was a New York Times bestseller. And he was a teacher at Harvard University. And uh, he was a professor of positive psychology. 
And when he first started his classes, he thought nobody would come. But over 10% of the entire student body at Harvard came. Do you know why? Because they're not happy. They're not happy. Because you know what's the first thing that they tell these guys when they come in on the orientation to Harvard University? One of the most prestigious universities in the entire world, right? The first thing they say to them is, you are the top of your classes. You are the top 1%. And congratulations on coming here. But let me tell you one thing. From now on to you graduate, most of you in this class, you will not even be average. You won't even be average. 50% of you will be below average. And for them to hear that for the first time, they got psychotic, right? <laughs> That's why they're at his class. So one of the things that he found out was a myth that people think that um, when you are successful, it breeds happiness. But what he found out in doing his research, he found out that happiness breeds success. It's the opposite of way around. Happiness breeds success. And happiness is different from joy because happiness is based on external things like if somebody gave you a new car, you would be happy, right? But joy is internal. Joy is something that no matter what happens, you can have it in here and nobody can take it away. And so joy is actually more powerful than happiness. So when you function in joy, you actually have the ability to become successful. And nobody can take that away from you. God wants you to be successful in everything that you do. But you have to learn how to function in joy. Okay? But, you know, me telling you, be joyful. I mean, you know, how long is that going to last, right? I mean, honestly, you might, you might be able to do it like maybe a couple of days, right, to be intentional about it. Um, but you know what? There's an easier way. There's actually an easier way. But joy is a sacrifice because that's what it says in the Bible, and I'll read it to you. It's in Psalms 27, verse 6, and it says, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Joy is a sacrifice. It has to cost you something. Okay? If it doesn't cost you something, it's not a sacrifice. So you just have to understand. You have to be intentional. It's going to cost you something, but there's a way that's, that's easier to go about doing it. Okay? Because I, I can't just muscle it and be so disciplined that I can just do this every day by myself. You can't. So what do I do? It, it's right in that verse. Okay? I will sing praises. When you praise the Lord, when you worship God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength, when you worship him, all of a sudden, joy fills your heart. That's why it works so well here. When you come for praise and worship, don't you feel better right after we sing? Joy fills your heart. Okay? But guess what? You don't only have to do it on Sundays. You could do it every single day. Every single day. And, and honestly, maybe some of you are struggling with your Bible reading. And you're going, it's so hard to read my Bible every day. I, I don't get anything from it. Well, maybe what you need to do is you need to worship Worship, worship until you feel it, and then read your Bible. I guarantee you, God will start to open the pages for you, okay? So worship is super, super for powerful, but there's another video that I want to show you. And I want to show you that, you know, it can even affect animals, okay? This, this next video that I'm going to show you is not a worship song, but it's just a guy playing a guitar, to some birds, okay? But watch and see how powerful just, just music is. And there's two birds in this video, and you have to decide which bird you're gonna be, okay? So let's watch it. Oh, the future looks 
See, music can have a powerful effect on you. And so when you worship, use music. But the, the thing is, engage God in your worship with all your heart. It doesn't mean that you have to, you know, jump up and down like that bird. But do you connect with God on, on a level that your heart connects with him? See, when your heart connects with him, all of a sudden, that's when your ability to hear just opens up. It just opens up. Some of you, you say, well, you know, I want to function more in the gifts. Like maybe you are pursuing the gift of prophecy, okay? I started to prophesy, but do you know how I started to learn how to do that? I would do it by first worshiping in a time of prayer. Like we would have um, prayer every week at Zoe in Thailand. And we would have loud, loud worship as people are praying. And so I would just worship for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then after that... I would start to pray for people, and then I didn't even realize it, but as I started to pray for people, I started to prophesy over them, and I didn't even realize that I was doing that. And as I kept doing that, it got better and better and better. But it started because I was pursuing God in worship. You know, sometimes maybe you pray for people, and they're sick, and you're just not feeling it. Well, why don't you worship before you pray? When you have the Spirit of God come upon you, it takes on a whole different dynamic. A whole different dynamic. It changes everything. It's a game changer. And so when you look at the people up here, when they worship, they lead you in worship, you should mimic them because they're trying to engage you to do everything to come into God's presence. Because when you're in his presence, there is no fear. When you're in his presence, there's no darkness. There's no depression. There's nothing except peace and joy and love. And when that flows out of your heart, nothing is impossible. And you will hear him clearly. And you'll know what to do. And if, even if he tells you to do something hard, you'll just do it. Why? Because you're joyful. It's easy to be obedient when you're joyful. So you strive to live a life of worship. You ever watch Pastor Mauricio? Like the guy is the happiest guy in the world. Right? I mean, it's like he never has a down day. Is it any wonder that this church is growing by leaps and bounds? Because he practices what I'm just telling you. He's filled with joy and God speaks to him. But you know what? That's what he wants for each and every one of you. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to be filled with joy so that you could be a light that's, that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. That it will attract so many people that they'll just say, what is it about you? How can I know God? Because you are the one who's being the light. 